Well, welcome to you and good morning. Uh, welcome to leadership and ministry in challenging times. I am uh, Ken Allen with the Office of Leader Care and Church Health. We're so glad that you've chosen to be with us today. And we, I'm excited about our lineup and the panelists that we have with us today. I believe we're going to have a great time. Um, preparing for what's next is on our hearts and minds as we attempt to go forward and go forward in a way that uh, pleases the Lord and certainly honors him and where we can see the church thrive uh, in challenging times as, as well. You're on the front lines and we want you to know that we are, are wanting to be a resource and an encouragement to you as you go through uh, the times that we live in with uh, COVID-19 and the angst of the moment as well. And we'll talk about that at the very end in our upcoming uh, webinars, um, trying to continue to help you through these times, assist you where we can, answer questions when we can as well. Again, excited about today's lineup, uh, the contributors that will be a part, the panelists here. Before I introduce them, I want to remind you every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m., Dr. Lance leads us in a time of prayer for uh, approximately 20 minutes, and so please join us uh, on these Wednesdays times, wonderful to times to be together. We've seen a few hundred at each one of these. And so again, I, I'm again grateful this morning to introduce to you the guys that are part of this, these, these men that have been a part of ministry, the wisdom that's a part of this. Uh, so we have Greg Corbin, Senior Pastor of Lakeside in Birmingham. He is also a chairman of our State Board of Missions, and we're so grateful to have him here uh, to really represent that, that active frontline pastor, boots on the ground kind of guy. Mike Jackson, by the way, these next few are all office directors here uh, at the State Board. Mike Jackson, Office Director, Leader Care and Church Health. Doug Rogers with uh, Communications and Technology. Keith Hibbs with Worship Leadership and Church Music. Daniel Edmonds with Sunday School and Discipleship. Rick Barnhart, Associational Missions and Discipleship. Bobby DuBois, who is the Associate Executive Director. And Dr. Rick Lance each one of us state missionaries, and he is, of course, our executive director. It's great to have each one of you here with us. Let me lead us in prayer as we begin to get into this time together. Father, we're grateful again for your presence with us. Father, for clarity of heart and mind, for being mindful of, of the um, 100 plus participants at this time who are here, uh, Lord, who are on the front line, and, and God, how these few moments together can be a time of encouragement and sharing uh, knowledge, and so we pray that you'd be honored and glorified through your church, that we'd continue to be about your work and your mission work. And Father, thank you for each man here. Bless them, uh, Lord, as they share in this time. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Again, I want to introduce uh, our state missionary and executive director, Dr. Rick Lance, as he shares with us some opening comments. Dr. Lance? Well, thank you, Ken. I do want to welcome you and thank you for being a part of this. Uh, let me just say that I have been clinging to Joshua 1 9, where, of course, the Lord said, Did, not, did I not command you to be strong and courageous and do not be dismayed? I'm with you wherever you go. I have a white knuckle kind of hold and clenched fist over that particular verse during this time in which we live. The word unprecedented has been used so many times, it's almost become trite, but there's no truer word to describe what we're going through and experiencing with the coronavirus. Let me say as a disclaimer, anyone who thinks that they're an authority and an expert on reopening churches, restarting, or whatever, is probably overstating. We're not trying to come across as experts. I don't think anyone here would like, would like to pretend to be one. But what we'd like to do is to offer some practical guidelines that might help you. The uh, guys in our state missionary force and task force, they have come up with a, a very good guideline, set of guidelines for 
the date in which the time in which we are able to begin reopening, which will be a process, not an event, most likely. In the early stages, I was a bit naive. I thought, well, one of these days, and by the way, I thought it might have been Easter. I thought it might have been the first Sunday in May. Our neighboring states, some churches are opening. Their governors have allowed them to do, do that. Uh, in our situation, we do not have clarity as to when that process of reopening will begin. But what we'll try to do today is to do some iron sharpening iron and help each one of us think through the process of beginning the restart or the reopening of our churches. I like to think of it in these ways. We have to consider the fellowship of our people. That is that we have to make sure that we keep them as safe as possible. We want to get back to in-person worship as soon as possible, but as safely as possible. That fellowship includes worship. Right now we're worshiping online. That has been very effective. The calls we've made across the state have really encouraged us because we did not expect to hear those encouraging words. Online giving, which leads me from fellowship to finances. Online giving has done well. We, through the State Board of Missions in partnership with the Baptist Foundation of Alabama, have tried to present a very effective, low-cost kind of offering for those who would like to use something online, different from what they have, or maybe they're just getting started. That is Give365. And uh, the, I should say, Give is spelled out, of course. Three is spelled out, and then 65. So you might want to check on that, because it is an option that you have, and it is something I, we think worthy of your consideration. The next uh, word, not only in fellowship, but finances, but we have to think about facilities. Those facilities basically have not been used for a while. We have to have deep, deep cleaning, sanitizing, in preparation for the usage of the facilities. When we do return, more than likely, we're not going to be able to come in mass like we'd like to. There will not be handshaking and hugging. Social distancing will be in operation. So to some, it might just be a hybrid to begin with. That is, you have online worship, and then some who are in person in attendance, or you may, of course, have multiple services. But what I'd like to conclude my time with, which is, I wanted to be brief, <clears throat> is the future. We know that what we're hearing from state health officials and national health officials, this virus could have a boomerang effect, a second wave, if you want to call it that, later on in the late fall or early winter. And we don't, know, have, we have, we don't have any idea, of course, what that would be like. But we have to prepare that in our preparing for what, what's next kind of planning. And I think today might not necessarily be the day to be thinking about that. However, uh, six months from now, seven months from now, we may be having to face a new set of circumstances. So again, I just tease that out for your thinking. Now let me conclude by saying, as one of the state missionaries in Alabama Baptist life and our state missionary force, we have tried our best to reach out and to be in contact with pastors the best we can. Our information is only as good as you give us on the ACP, which uh, is not as popular as it used to be in terms of people turning it in. But we've done many cycles of that now. I've already mentioned, we've been encouraged what we've heard. I liken this as being, being in suspension between two trapeze swings. And, and Alabama Baptist, and I think Southern Baptist as a whole, have been able to handle that suspension in midair, if you will, real well. Without panic, it's a calm concern, but no panic. There is a deepening frustration, restlessness growing among some. We, did, we have done our best to try to find out some kind of uh, marking or guideline as to when we might be able to begin that process of reopening. I think in a matter of weeks, we'll have some clarity on that. I'm not sure about that. I don't know that. I don't have any inside knowledge per se. I've had some strategic conversations. So that I, would, I would simply say to you, in preparing for what's next, let's look in terms of stages 
the early stages, the, the mid stages, and the later stages. And with that, I'll end my comments by saying, we're in this with you, and we're going to help you in any possible way we can. All right, thank you, Dr. Lance. Um, it, it is always great to hear from our state missionary and executive director, uh, Dr. Lance, and the words are, are encouraging as well as thought provoking toward the future as well. Uh, Mike Jackson, now our uh, Leader Care and Church Health Office Director, uh, will uh, begin to field questions and submit them accordingly. Mike. Thank you, Ken. Uh, first question comes from Bart Teal. Do state law slash health directives currently prohibit churches from regathering as tentative plans to begin to gather in multiple services with enhanced distancing and sanitizing carefully addressed as early as May 17th unrealistic. So uh, let's deal with the first part of that. Do state law health directives currently prohibit churches from regathering? Any of our state missionaries want to address that? Well, I'll take a, take a chance to uh, give an answer. Basically, the gathering of groups uh, have been limited to 10 or fewer, and they're half, according to what I understand and according to what we've been sharing and trying to help folks in uh, putting together our documents and our guidelines, uh, we've tried to encourage that. Uh, we have been allowed to do outdoor worship, drive-in type services with individuals staying in their cars, with them properly spaced out, and with there being no contact between the groups of folks that are attending in those services. Uh, at some point in time on down the road, uh, there's probably going to be a lessening of that 10 in attendance uh, inside a meeting uh, where it will be up to, uh, what that number may look like. It could be 25, it could be 50. But we do believe what we're hearing is that all of this is going to be incremental. It's going to be phased in. Uh, phase one, uh, two weeks later, they'll observe what's happened. Phase two will then take place is what we're understanding and what we are hearing and how we're interpreting what uh, the governor has mandated or has shared with us and the public health officials. Okay, the second part of his questions are tentative plans to begin to gather in multiple services with enhanced distancing and sanitizing carefully addressed as early as May 17th unrealistic. Uh, Bart, that's a tough question. And I, I guess the best answer we can give you at this point in time is that uh, not knowing what the governor's going to say on May 15th when uh, the safer at home order is uh, addressed and whether that's prior in that week she addresses that but the current order safer at home is in place until may 15th which is a friday yes there could possibly be some churches that are allowed to gather now we may not be able to gather at full capacity there may be limits placed on that again we don't have any insights we don't have any definite understanding of what that's going to look like so at this time uh, May 17th may or may not be a good day. All we know is that as we currently see things, we're not allowed to gather in our churches, in our church buildings, in our facilities for corporate worship at this time. And I think, Mike, if I could add to that in the um, guide that we've prepared for our churches, preparing for what's next that's available on ausbaum.org. Um, there, there is a, a couple of pages there that my team was working with Lee Wright, Scotty Goldman, and myself. Uh, we were uh, giving some suggestions, particularly on your question. Contact mitigation would be that section, and some questions that you might want to ask, and then some suggestions that we make uh, as to how to go about, you know, like removing hymnals, not giving out. Uh, bulletins or any other handouts, children and you sitting with their parents. I mean, some basic things there that that will be a help to use as you try to prepare your folks to to coming back into that facility. Uh, very good um, helps there available to you. Uh, Mike, one of the things we learned <clears throat> that uh, 
helped me stretch my thinking on, on gathering together is that, and Keith Hill's probably going to address this, congregational singing will probably not be advised because as I understand it, that when you're singing, the syllabic projectiles, I'm trying to be delicate here, can go as far as 13 feet. Now, I didn't know we, we could do that, but in congregational singing, and you're doing that close, in close proximity, even at six feet distancing, it may not be advisable to begin with that in mind. So that's one little point. The earlier comment about uh, May 15, the governor is set, I think, to reevaluate where we are. Now, the health officials keep talking about we're data-driven rather than date-driven. Uh, that, that's true. Uh, I think that's what their thinking is. But hopefully the data will allow a date to be, at some point, beginning this process. And I hope it's not too far away. Good word, Dr. Lance. Thank you for giving us uh, that insight. Someone else want to address that? Got a couple more questions, but if you want to address that one, feel free. We got a question from Danny Dean. Danny says, I was asked by one of our pastors, could we have church outside in lawn chairs at six feet distance, reflecting on drive-in church? Not sure if this is acceptable, but I need input to share. Anybody want to take an opportunity to address that? Well, right now, uh, let me begin by saying that uh, we didn't even have clarity on the uh, drive-in services there for a while. And through a little bit of uh, communication and information sharing later, which has been a few weeks ago, the governor's office did release something about drive-in worship services or drive up. But that includes staying in the automobile with the windows rolled up and listening to an FM radio or having the windows down perhaps and listening to someone, uh, listening to the pastor and maybe a soloist or whatever on a platform. The idea of getting lawn chairs has not been addressed. And I think um, if you, th having it outside like that. One of these days in a not too distant future, it's going to be rather hot to have anything outside. And that has to be considered. Another thing is that people do not, people are, we're all social beings and we tend to gravitate to each other if we're out, out of our vehicles and sitting in lawn chairs. I'm not, I'm not real sure. That's, that's one of the gray areas. We, we can try to find that out information, but I, I cannot give a definitive word on it because uh, we don't have it. And let me say this, and this is not to sound defensive, but it does sound that way. We have been asked, or I have been asked, to give clarity where there isn't clarity, and that is to in, maybe even circumvent or usurp the governor's guidelines because they don't quite fit what the needs are, and they're concerned about a lot of things, a lot of issues related to it. Obviously, I, I or no one on our staff has the authority to give a go-ahead with churches to do anything, that is, to meet or not meet. We've never told people what to do. We've kept trying to give suggestions. And what we'll try to do is the best we can find out if that uh, lawn chair approach, which has some merit, uh, we'll, we'll try to find information about that. But if you go into Walmart right now, the way I, a few times I've been in, is your they mark off a six feet kind of approach and you're th there just ever so briefly. That would have to be pretty well true. And by the way, the, uh, the distance, the social distancing has been around longer than I thought. But initially the social distancing was 10 feet and they modified it to be six. So uh, I, I don't know that we have a clear word on lawn chairs. Be honest with you, if we had that, I just assume we have it inside the church because you get people outside already. I don't know if that's a good answer, Mike. That's the best I can come up with. Uh, Mike? Yes, sir. Um, Go ahead. I've been in pretty constant contact with my counterparts in the other states uh, with, uh, 
with all kinds of questions concerning how to gather together. I do not know any uh, example of the lawn chairs. Uh, I think the idea behind allowing the cars is that is a natural barrier. Um, Dr. Lance mentioned the heat. There's another factor there, especially if you're doing singing. Uh, the wind may carry those droplets. I don't know. Um, so I, I would tend to uh, suggest that uh, you hold off on that. Thank you, Keith. Let me uh, look at another question. Clark Skelton has asked, uh, one of the challenges that our church, Valley Grand Baptist, Selma, has found is purchasing disinfecting materials and hand sanitizer, mask, and so forth. Any suggestions for purchasing these items in bulk? And I know Bobby has uh, been helping us here at the State Board of Missions with some purchasing of hand sanitizer, and Rick Barnhart's subgroup uh, worked on some of that. Uh, I'm going to toss it to Bobby. Bobby, would you give an answer and give us some information about that? And then, uh, Rick, you can follow up after Bobby finishes. There is a location uh, in the Pelham area that is uh, uh, selling uh, the hand sanitizer in bulk, and we've ordered some from here. Um, I'll put that address uh, out on uh, the discussion page here uh, so that you'll have access to it, but it's a uh, 75% alcohol base, which is better than, than the 60 to 62 that some of the, the sanitizers are coming out with right now. Uh, very inexpensive as far as I'm concerned on what I've seen in other sites, uh, but it's a pretty quick delivery turnaround time on the hand sanitizer. Rick, do you have any follow-up on that since your group worked on facilities and general cleaning? Yeah, I, I don't have resources like the one Bobby just mentioned. Uh, but, you know, the, the critical part of, of how many people are in the restroom at a time, uh, are the doors propped open to the, to the church building, to the restrooms themselves, uh, the contact is, is so critical that uh, the cleaning between, if you even do a Sunday school or uh, worship time, whether, whether they have uh, cleaning taking place frequently. Thank you, sir. Uh, again, I think uh, just continue to search through uh, your suppliers and see what they have available and uh, try to make sure that those items are there and available to your people whenever we do get the opportunity to recongregate on campus and in our facilities. Uh, Follow-up question that Bart Teal had and another person has asked uh, deals with uh, capacity. Uh, do you anticipate that staged restart will be set numbers of percentage of seating capacity? Anybody want to address that from our group? Well, that is a good one because if your facility is 75% full, you're full. And how you social distancing, do any social distancing, I'd rather call it healthy distancing, with 75% or near capacity. I, I think uh, the health profi professionals and the governor will probably deal with numbers, uh, not maybe not considering or maybe not thinking through the size of churches on the landscape of Alabama life. I think they, they might be able to get that uh, up into percentages, but they'll be, I think they're going to probably, they've been working with numbers like you can only have 10, perhaps the next time you can only have 50, I don't know. But the percentage thing, um, I would think you have to have multiple services and have around 50% when you get back together, have 50% or less capacity and have multiple services. My thinking is <clears throat> no matter what size church, you may have to have multiple services on like on a Saturday night, early Sunday morning, Sunday, all kinds of things like that, plus magnifying the online service, worship service for those who are have underlying conditions or who are uh, vulnerable because of age. And then you're gonna have families to be very uh, concerned about having their children come into a preschool in a, an area like that. So those are legitimate concerns. And we again, we'll try to find out if there's gonna be a percentage marker as well as a number. 
out there. We'll try to do that. Yeah, there certainly is some good ideas that are coming out uh, now from our from our pastors. Uh, as someone mentioned, a smaller church may have a bit of a, uh, a leg up on some of our larger churches just because of the sheer number. Uh, and yet there are those that are large that I begin to hear some ideas such as Sunday school classes meeting outside and watching uh, like at a park and watching the live stream together. So kind of a spin on being able to be together yet still um, healthy distancing uh, during that time. Their, their churches are looking at uh, registering for certain uh, services. If they have multiple services, then maybe registering so they know that they have a definite amount at each one. There are some that are looking at uh, uh, an alphabetical range. Uh, so there's a number of different ideas that are floating out there that will try to get a balanced approach to um, when gathering does begin to take place again. So it's good to think outside the box. I like that idea of Sunday school classes being able to, to meet together, uh, but yet still at the same time be outside or something like that and, and view the service. So good, good thoughts that are going on. Thank you, Ken. Uh, this question comes from David Hobson. How do you recommend responding to a pastor that says there are times where not obeying the law in civil disobedience is biblical, such as in the book of Daniel? I'd be willing to answer that the book of Daniel says that Daniel asked permission of the king's steward. Anyone else want to address that? And, and there are those that are getting uh, discouraged, and some are even to the point of wanting to defy the recommendations that have been laid out and, and the, the guidelines that we've been given. As a part of that, the uh, whole idea is, is that uh, I think we need to err on the side of caution, as well as what we need to do is to make sure that we send the right message to our community and to our people that we uh, care for them and that we're concerned about their health and their well-being. And I do believe that this season will pass shortly. And I'm convinced that as we are obedient to those in authority, as the scriptures also says, that uh, we find that balance that helps us to love our people, to encourage our people, as well as to set the right example in, in the light of our public view. Uh, if I could, speak to that for just a moment. Yes, sir, I, Thank you. Um, you know, I certainly um, agree that uh, there are times, as scripture says, that we must obey God rather than man. Uh, I certainly agree that um, we are not to neglect assembling together. Um, and so I'm, I'm very much uh, anxious as everyone else to get back to gathering on Sunday in the Lord's house. But I, I think the issue would be different if churches were just being singled out. And if, if everyone else was, was allowed to, to be opened back up and they're still having sporting events or whatever, and then, uh, but then churches were being singled out, that, that hasn't happened uh, because what we're, what we're dealing with affects everybody, it affects all gatherings and those things. And, um, so I, I understand the frustration. I, I really do. But at the same time, we're dealing with, with a virus and the health and safety of, of people, both uh, in our churches, but in our community, in our neighborhoods, and uh, in our cities. So that's a, that's a different uh, issue than, um, so, so that's why I think that churches have willingly submitted and it's not that uh, we or at least at our church we don't feel like um we feel like it's it's the right thing to do it's the, it's being a good neighbor um and it's it's for the health and safety uh of our city and community thank you for your response greg anyone else want to share a word before we move on well, i would just say that um we, we can 
meet in groups of 10. I don't want to get too, uh, too far into this, but th the limit is 10. And that 10, uh, if, if you're not uh, a part of a family, uh, then certainly there should be social distancing. Um, so, you, you know, I don't want to, if you're a, a church of 20, there is the freedom to meet, but you're meeting in groups of 10 and you're social distancing while you're doing it. So there is, a, there is some freedom within that. There's not a complete shutdown, so to speak. If I'm wrong in that, please uh, correct me. All right, I've got another question. Uh, and this one comes from Mike Presswood. What are some options for having VBS if church is not allowed to meet at the church facilities? So Daniel, I'll toss that one to you since you and your office handled Vacation Bible School as well as your work group dealt with those issues in small groups and meetings. Yeah, thanks for the question, Mark. Um, the first thing I want to say is that if you will go to kidslinkal.org, uh, you'll be able to see a good Zoom meeting discussion with Melita Thomas at Lifeway uh, with Vacation Bible School, but also some leaders around our state. And so that would be a good place to, to listen. They talk about really four that they had identified uh, early on. And then in the conversation, some others uh, chimed in with different ideas that they're doing. The second thing that I want to say quickly in response to that, Mark, is that uh, as I've talked with leaders around our state, the good news for me concerning Vacation Bible School is they are all committed to uh, conduct Vacation Bible School in some way, shape, or fashion because uh, it's still the number one evangelistic tool that we use or consistently all of our churches can use. And, uh, and so they are committed. I'm hearing quite a few that say they will be delaying to mid-July or later. Uh, some are doing a hybrid approach of where they will uh, maybe do a one or two day uh, thing before the summer is over and then use the material on into uh, their regular church schedule, for example, on Wednesday nights or something like that uh, in, in relationship to it. Many of them are saying that when they do it, if they are able to do it in July and August, because of the idea of social distancing, they will probably try to do as much outside and in large open spaces that they may have in their church, as opposed to classrooms, uh, because some of the, the children, social distancing is a little bit foreign to them. I know my five-year-old grandson, if it's moving, is gonna hug it. So, uh, you know, there's some issues there. But uh, also some good uh, uh, Zoom meetings conducted by State Missionaries Belinda Stroud uh, and Patty Burns that uh, hopefully Doug can help direct us to, but at the reopen site and other places you'll be able to find those that do go over some extra sanitation issues uh, that you have with uh, children in preschool especially because uh, you know preschoolers uh, many of them if they touch it it's going to go in their mouths and so you got to clean quickly things like uh, if, if they're going to use bibles and materials then they need to bring their own bible or have their material assigned so that you can uh, address the handling issue so it, it is a fairly complex issue but many people are wanting to tackle it because of the high value they put on doing vacation bible school backyard kids club uh, and, and those type of uh, things. So, again, Mark, thanks for the question. Daniel, let me also uh, throw this question to you. Uh, one of the things that will be asked or has been asked, Stephen Brown asked, in your opinion, will recommendations likely prohibit small group meetings within church facilities initially once congregational meetings are introduced? Daniel, would you address that? Stephen, uh, again, that's a really good question, and you're asking me for an opinion, and I may be one of the world's worst uh, for giving uh, an opinion, but I do think that within the guidelines of what we'll see, again, there'll be some things like capacity issues and, and social distancing that will come into play. I think the most critical issue when you start talking about uh, groups gathering again on campus is the issue of preschool and children. 
so uh, you've got to keep in mind, for example, uh, preschool always in, in planning for Sunday school is one of the most critical areas because uh, you can use a preschool room for children, youth, or adults, but preschoolers cannot use adult classrooms. And so you have a limited number of rooms on your campus available for preschool. And so you really have to carefully, cautiously think through uh, those kind of things. The response, I want to say, I want to share the opinion of churches that I've been talking to, is that when they come back to campus, first of all, they're going to focus on worship and, and making sure that they can do that correctly uh, and with all the precautions that are necessary. And then they'll begin to tackle the issue of groups. The prevailing thought for most of them is early on, they will have a limited number of groups. For example, some say that they will use some of their rooms for senior adults, since most senior adults cannot uh, participate in a Facebook Live or Zoom. They don't have the same capacity or desire that some of the younger ones do. So they will begin to come back somewhat in phases or stages. Uh, Ken Allen kind of mentioned earlier that some are saying uh, one of the things that they will do because they're doing Zoom or whatever for their uh, adults right now is begin to suggest that maybe some of the adults gather in other places. Uh, where they can also social distance. And so you begin to have one or two families coming together and uh, participating in their, their Sunday school class, life group, whatever uh, in, in that uh, arena. And so again, it's kind of an end stage progressing toward the, uh, the day where everyone begins to feel comfortable with what we're doing and the church, uh, can address some of those other issues that you're already asking about. How do you handle who comes to what worship? The same would be say, said about to which Bible study. So it is a slow process of working through that. It is a critical thing to keep in mind both senior adults, kind of either end of the spectrum, they're senior adults in preschool uh, because of the needs of those two groups and how you're going to address coming back uh, to campus over time. But it is. Uh, the prevailing thought that it'll be done in, in stages and probably not immediately because worship will be given the priority for the immediate future. Thank you, Daniel. Thomas Wright has sent in a question. Can local mayors grant permission to meet in cities where the infection rate are quite low? And Thomas, I'm not sure that we can answer that because again, that's out of our area of responsibility. I'm going to say that just as the president has deferred uh, leadership to the governors, at some point the governor may defer leadership to those on the local scene, but right now uh, that's not known. Uh, and so to be able to try to answer that, I don't know that I could give you a definitive answer. Chris Crane has sent in a, a question. Chris says, we appreciate your assistance for churches specifically in, in their work weekday work in their church offices as they began opening for essential administrative activities. Can you point us to a simple one-page set of guidelines that gives direction on safe workplace practices, routine cleaning, keeping guests safe, and suggested sanitation in a church office setting? Uh, anybody want to answer that? Rick, that was uh, some of your work groups with the uh, uh, facilities, you want to take a stab at that one? That was a question that we didn't specifically answer in, in our project and our working on uh, facilities and cleaning, sanitizing. But one of the things that we're practicing here at the State Board, if, if there is uh, a ministry assistant present, there are not other ministry assistants in that suite present. Um, there, there is certainly social spacing taking place uh, across or physical spacing taking across, uh, across the board. But I think the one page that we have prepared there for facilities could be uh, reworked a, a little bit and, uh, and a guide being prepared would be helpful for, for what he's asking, which is the office setting. And it's 
sad. I, I've not seen many uh, guides or guidelines or documents that have been put together that are that brief of one page. Everything I've seen has been quite lengthy uh, to be all inclusive and to be as comprehensive as possible. But I'll keep my eyes open, Chris, and if I find something or see something that's available, I'll make sure that uh, we get it to you ASAP. Barry Cosper sends a question. He says, Dr. Lance recently spoke to the aspect of seating capacity on a percentage basis instead of a numerical factor. I like that better. What is the recommended percentage? He goes on to say, Tom Rayner has stated that seating capacity would be 60% instead of the accepted 80%. Is a 60% viable? Again, I'll just say that the governor has used numbers rather than percentages. At some point, it would be helpful for, uh, probably for her to give us some latitude on percentages because, uh, as we well know, there are all kinds of churches across our state in terms of size. And I, I do agree, I think it's more like for social distancing or healthy distancing, I think it's gonna be more like 50% or less rather than 60. I don't know where Tom Rayner came up with that number. I think he's thinking when we come back Long -term. in a full functional way that rather than 75 or 80%, that the full capacity would be 60. Well, yeah, and that would call for multiple services. Thank you, Dr. Lance. I also worried about capacity. Um, if if you go to your worship center and you get a, a tape measure and really look at it and look at, okay, if um, what what would that practically be uh, to allow six feet between people or between couples, and then do you need to uh, block off every other pew because you have the issue of people sitting uh, behind you and in front of you. And when you really do that, your capacity goes down um, much more than you think it does. So I would advise churches to, to really look at that practically if you're thinking about how many services we need to have uh, when we come back and those kind of things, your, your capacity is very likely less than you think it is when you look at that social distancing of six feet. Good word, Greg, thank you. Uh, Ken Letson has uh, shared a question with us. He says, what is the thinking when we're here open perhaps in groups of 50, and making sure we don't have more than the prescribed number come to each service. Do we have sign-ups? Do we assign people? How do we handle visitors who would not be signed up? And what the number would count uh, everyone in the building, including those on the stage, tech people, et cetera? And is that per building? If we have people meeting in more than one building at a time, could we exceed the number of 50? Mike, can I address that, please, sir? Sir, Keith, thank you. Uh, I've heard a lot of folks talking about how to do the multiple services um, and everything from alphabetically assigned to um, uh, other, other ways to do it. I would suggest that uh, the best way to do it maybe would be to uh, do it according to um, high risk, low risk factors. Uh, maybe have one service that you set up for uh, those who are high risk senior adults or who have medical issues that would feel more comfortable uh, being with others of that um, of that risk uh, factor uh, and then uh, make sure that families sit together uh, since they've been around each other um, and I would also uh, uh, think that the 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 uh, number uh, counted would include stage and tech people. Um, I've had folks talk about doing uh, more than one service at the time in different uh, worship service areas. 
Uh, I like that idea, but if you do go that direction, you would need to have assigned uh, access and assigned parking. Uh, so there's no mingling in the uh, congregating areas uh, that they would go in that door and go out maybe another door. Um, a lot of um, a lot of factors to consider there logistically, uh, but that's 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 my thinking on it. Thank you, Keith. Anybody else want to respond? One other word about the visitors. I, I forgot that part of the question. Uh, I would have assigned areas for visitors that may tend to isolate them, but we're all being isolated. So, thank you. Chris Gwynn uh, asked the question, is there a voice speaking to the governor for the small church? We have churches that seat 250 that have an attendance of 50. Uh, and my question just popped out of the way. Let me see, there it is. I know of one church that seats 350 and has 40. They can easily meet with social distancing. We have uh, tried to back channel with the governor's office and we have advocated for all of our churches, but particularly we've said the smaller churches are in a little bit different category, especially those which are uh, in counties or areas where there have not been as much of the outbreak as there have been in urban areas. But it's been hinted at earlier, um, I don't know, no one's ever told me this, but I cannot help but believe that when the governor begins to reevaluate that uh, there'll be some places that will have more freedom than others if, if they're not in high impact areas. Now, I have nothing to go on on that. I wish I did. The, uh, right now, the governor's listening to health officials and they are very concerned. They're laser focused, as I said earlier, on the entirety of the uh, worst case scenario. They're trained that way. And I guess I would be too if I were. I were them. We're trying to find something of a best case scenario, looking at the worst case scenario and trying to find a workable scenario. And the, um, no matter how good a church person is in politics or government, they tend to think of churches kind of in one way, just people gathering. And they don't think about necessarily the size of it, and except for the larger churches. And a lot of times when they think about worship, since some of them go to larger churches, that image pops in their mind as they're thinking about having worship. And I, I do, I cannot help but believe though that, and I again have nothing to go on. Uh, it's been very limited on the back channeling. I've had to go ways that I didn't think I'd have to, but I, I think they're keeping it very close to the best, so to speak, on what they're planning to do or might be the next step. But I think that's a good point. Churches that have had uh, <clears throat> that have had better days when they have a big, large worship center and they have small attendance, I think that is a legitimate question. And when the time comes, if they throw numbers out rather than percentages, which is probably what they'll do, then that one needs to be addressed. Thank you, Dr. Lance. Uh, a couple of comments. Greg Platt has uh, given us uh, a link to an uh, opportunity uh, to find some information, and that has been posted in the Q&A as well as in the chat. If you're interested about office, uh, that comes from a group that he is aware of, so you can uh, access that in the Q&A and as well as in the chat. Uh, Mona Crawford has also reminded us uh, that the uh, spacing, as Greg was talking about earlier, the six foot distance, it may mean that you have to skip two pews in between every other based upon how close those pews are. So keep that in mind. Uh, Greg, you've been a big help today. I wanna give you an opportunity to just kind of share what Lakeside's doing and give us a perspective from the local church setting and as a senior pastor, uh, and with the heart both for the local church as well as the state convention, give us some of your perspective as uh, you have uh, been working with your group there at Lakeside. Well, um, 
you know, we, we certainly are like everyone else. We're, we're just praying and watching and waiting. Uh, I did share with our church that we're going to reopen with three principles. Uh, we're going to reopen in a measured way, uh, recognizing the, the health and safety concerns and, and, uh, the government uh, recommendations. So we're going to reopen in a measured way. We're going to reopen the prioritized way. Um, that means that uh, the first priority will be worship. Um, and we'll come back uh, at least initially with, with only Sunday morning worship. And then we'll reopen in a gradual way. We'll, we'll reopen Sunday morning worship and then phase other things back in. So so we've shared with our folks that we'll, we'll reopen in a measured way, a prioritized way, in a gradual way. And I liken it to uh, many of us grew up going to school. Remember the old gymnasiums? You could turn the, uh, the lights out in those old high school gyms. Well, you flip that switch and all the lights would go out all at once. But then when you turn the lights back on, uh, a few would come back on and begin to flicker and then a few more and they, they came on very, they went off suddenly, but they came on very gradually. And to me, that's a, that's a, a helpful analogy of how we're going to have to think in terms of our churches. We flip the switch really quickly and we shut activities down except for online. But now we don't have a switch that we're going to flip that turns everything back on all of a sudden. We're going to have to initiate what's most important, which most people feel is Sunday morning worship, and then uh, see how that goes and learn from our first attempts at that, and then look to phase back in other things. Um, so that's, that's the perspective that, that we've shared with our folks at Lakeside. And I'll add one more thing. There are so many unknowns, and that's so frustrating. We don't know uh, when we'll be able to meet uh, in person again. We don't know what things will be like um, when we are able to meet again necessarily. But we, we have begun to prepare for, we don't know when the first Sunday we'll meet again will be, but we have kind of mapped out what that may look like, what preparations we'll have to make, what meetings we'll have to have in advance of that. And so that's, that's something that we can work toward. We just don't have the date for it, or we don't know how many services we may have to have. But it's been helpful for me personally. There's so many things I, I don't know or qu answers that I don't have. If I can pick some things to work toward, hey, that I can do, that I can plan toward, that's been very helpful for me personally because, um, you know, we walk by faith and not by sight um, uh, has a little deeper meaning for all of us now than it did a few weeks ago. Good word, Greg. Thank you for helping us with that. Uh, another question has come in. What about fellowship meals? Uh, some churches are wanting to have their Wednesday night meals or fellowship opportunities. Uh, one church here, it says, missed their homecoming service in April and they want to have a meal together at church. Anyone want to address that? Well, <laughs> in all honesty, I think meals cause a, ho a host of challenges, not only in preparation, seating, and dealing with them. And I, I am uh, probably more concerned about having that than anything we've talked about because uh, it, it, it's called fellowship meals for a reason. People don't normally fellowship at a distance. Mm. And it's going to be hard to get them. We're again, social beings. We want to be with people. And I also believe that uh, if you did that sort of thing, you probably wouldn't have the attendance you think you might have. And uh, if restaurants are being limited to 50% capacity when they open, then I would imagine that would have to work for churches as well, if not more so. Thank you, Dr. Lance. I know our time's about over. I'm trying to make sure I address and I'm scanning through the questions as best I can to help out to make sure. Uh, one question that comes in that I think is important and uh, 
we just need to address and give a word of encouragement it comes from Danny Corson, one of our associational missionary strategists. He says, what words of encouragement would you have for pastors who are under increasing pressure from members to defy the governor's directives? The pressure is increasing as businesses defy the orders and some sheriff's offices or departments have said they will not enforce the directives in their county. Well, Mike, you deal with church conflict, and this is a church conflict issue. When this whole episode began, we were having all kinds, well, not all kinds, we were having various conflict situations that Mike was having to, and others were having to work through where the leadership of the church wanted to do one thing. The pastor was concerned over here and for a lot of reasons, and that has continued. Now, the smaller the church and in more in less urban areas, I, probably sheriff's departments will not enforce it. But I think that that one is just almost unanswerable because it is just it is it's embedded with all kinds of conflict. I can tell you one thing we had a pastor mention not long ago. He has 12 deacons. Four wanted to open, and they were vigorously advocating that. Four were adamantly saying we should not do it, and four were caught in the middle. Now try to lead those deacons. If there's anyone, any any group we need to be praying for, is we would need to be praying for pastors in general, but particularly pastors who are dealing with churches who are in conflict over what we need to do next. And that one is, as I say, almost unanswerable because it has, uh, it's just fraught with all kinds of conflict. Now, Mike, you may be able to answer that better. No, Dr. Lance, I think that the word of challenge or maybe encouragement to our pastors is that in times like this, uh, it just takes courage to be the leader that God's called you to be. And as you uh, step out courageously, understand that the Lord's with you. Uh, he is going to guide you. Uh, that doesn't mean you're not going to have those struggles, especially as Dr. Lance outlined, uh, that one pastor, bless his heart, with 12 deacons having three different opinions, uh, those deacons in three different camps. That's going to be a challenge, and uh, all I can say is that as you prayerfully consider the and ask for wisdom from above, and that's the thing that, as I've talked to pastors across the state, they say, would you pray for us for wisdom? And, and that would be the thing I would encourage, that we continue to pray for one another, that we will have the wisdom from above, and that whatever we do, we will make sure that we uh, do God's will and that we try to lead courageously, even in the tough times. Uh, leaders have not always made people happy. And I heard somebody say one day in leadership, if you wanna make folks happy, sell ice cream. But I've got a caveat to that. If you run out of my flavor, you're not gonna make me happy even if you sell ice cream. So the bottom line is there are gonna be some challenges as leaders, but rest assured, uh, God is there to encourage you. I shared this with one of our pastors who was struggling, and this was a word of encouragement shared with me almost 50 years ago when I answered the call to ministry as a teenage boy. Uh, I had a wise lady come up to me after that service where I made my decision for vocational ministry, and she said, Mike, always remember this, God plus you make the majority. And I realize as I've tried to give leadership through the years, those words of encouragement have always been ringing in my ears that if I am on God's plan, if I'm following God's will, I'm in the majority because ultimately the person I've got to please is my Lord and Savior, my Heavenly Father. So uh, I seek to do that. Now, I don't know if that's a word of encouragement, but uh, I just want our pastors to know we're praying for you as you lead in this challenging time and as you lead with courage. I've got one other question that maybe we can answer quickly, and then we're going to be respectful of people's time. Uh, we thank you for this. This is probably something we'll address again. Uh, Ken's going to give us a synopsis of uh, 
what's coming up the next couple of weeks. But one question comes in from Herbert Brown. He wants to know any ideas about camps in July. Anybody want to address that? I know Keith Hibbs, you've got some camps that are going on. Daniel, there are some things in your area of responsibility. I know there are some things with our student ministry, with Mike Nuss and Scooter Kellum. And I know those decisions are still being made, but any of you want to give a word of information? I enlarge the, the June camps have that issue is settled. July, not so much. There's still ongoing discussion uh, for July camps uh, because most people are holding out uh, in hope that we can proceed but uh, probably discussions will be taking place on those in the next few weeks and uh, decisions on them will be um, put out in the public domain so people will be able to adjust accordingly. But it is, it is a, a, a difficult decision because we really want to be able to uh, conduct these, these camps. Just like Vacation Bible School, we understand their importance and uh, we want to do all that we can uh, to, to make them happen if possible. Good word, Daniel. Uh, uh, Herbert, I really deeply appreciate your church uh, involvement in our mixed music camp uh, every year. And we are in the process of having some meetings about that. And we will, we will notify all of your people who have already registered, especially uh, when that decision is made. Thank you, Daniel and Keith, for those responses. I want to say to all of you who have been a part of this how much we appreciate your being in uh, on this webinar. We wish that uh, we could uh, give you more definite answers. Uh, we can't tell you what we don't know. We are here to encourage you. We're here to help you. Uh, these guys have been hard at work as they uh, worked behind the scenes with their work groups to put together a document that we hope will be of help to you. If you've ever got any questions about that, you can access that online and uh, go to alsbaum.org slash reopen and you can find our document and those things that we want to make available to you. But uh, there are lots of resources out there. Other conventions have done their ideas, put those together in a document and uh, we're, we're hoping that whatever we can get on our, our hands on, we'll make available to you and that you'll use it for your benefit. I'm gonna pitch it back to Ken Allen. Ken, uh, thank you for helping uh, launch this and helping us think through these items. For each of our panelists, I can't say enough how much I appreciate your involvement. Uh, I'm sure you'll be getting phone calls, emails, mm -hmm. uh, text messages regarding the future and some of those other thoughts. But Ken, uh, you share with us what lies ahead. Yes, and I think a big word here is we're trying to hit a moving target. And uh, the big, and I think another big word is adapting. Uh, this is not a big reopen. This is a soft and slow uh, reopen. And uh, I think adapting to our surroundings is, is a good word uh, for now as, as well. And again, we welcome your calls and emails uh, during this time. And as you've seen, we don't always have the answer, but if we can try to go and, and to find it, then, then certainly we will. Again, thank you to all uh, who are a part of this today. Thank you for joining us uh, as well. And uh, let me close us with a word of prayer. Father, again, these are uh, challenging times. God, we're so grateful that uh, our anchor holds within the solid rock. And so, Father, that rock is Jesus, and he is the one. So, Father, our ultimate dependence, wisdom, guidance, and instruction is from a daily walk with the risen Lord Jesus. And so, again, thank you, Father, for being part of Great Commission work. And uh, thank you, God, for the, the men that you've been uh, allowed to be a part of this time and for those men and women who are out on the front line as well ministering in our local churches. And we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. God bless.